Which wacky coaching film is more plausible? Whoopi Goldberg, random fan coaching the Knicks in Eddie, or a stat geek middle schooler coaching in the MLB a la Little Big League? Also, who's going to win more? You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily podcast on fantasy basketball. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team, every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball. We're going to be talking about day three of Las Vegas Summer League action in today's show. Also, a couple of free agent signings that have gone down in the last 24 hours. Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. All right. What we first want to talk about, though, is if you do want to be a part of the Red Rock Challenge Leagues, go look at my Twitter timeline at RedRock underscore B-Ball, obviously, and look for the Google Form link. You'll see it all over the timeline. Fill in that application, and by application, basically, email address, what sort of league you want to be in, roto, head-to-head, or points. Do you want paid or free? And uh, do you want draft only, regular, or are you interested in both type of leagues? I've sent out some early invites for some draft only formats. The points, one of those is full. If we continue to get more interest, we'll just open up more of those draft leagues. There's no problem. Head-to-head and Roto are got one spot left each in those. And then in the next couple of weeks, we'll get emails out for all the uh, standard feeder leagues for the Champions League. Head-to-head and Roto and starting a new points league division of the Red Rock Challenge as well. So go fill in your details over there by checking out the timeline. Let's start with free agency. Davis Bertans goes back to the San Antonio Spurs on a four-year, $20 million deal. Yeah, fair enough deal. He didn't play very much last season. I thought he should have played more, especially over guys like Joffrey Laverne. They need that extra option in the front court with Kyle Anderson going to the Memphis Grizzlies. I gave all my thoughts on Kyle Anderson in yesterday's podcast, so if you haven't listened to that, go check it out and uh, hear my thoughts on Anderson and his, uh, and his move to Memphis uh, so Bertans is going to be one of those three-point streaming options you can find on the waiver wire. Not going to be a really a threat for standard league action. Tory Craig has also gone back to the Denver Nuggets, a two-year, $4 million deal. No options on that. No uh, non-guarantees as well, apparently. With Baby Neck Wilson Chandler traded to Philadelphia, Craig looks like he will slot into that backup small forward role. Yes, Juan Shohuna Gomez played there a little bit last season. I think he's more of a four, and, um, and he's in for a big year this year in terms of uh, importance, not necessarily big in terms of production. Um, but Michael Malone does love Tory Craig, so I could see Craig getting those minutes, freeing up a little bit of fight and Will Barton to play at point guard because there is literally no backup point guard on this team. Monty Morris is still a two-way guy, and I like I like what Monty Morris can do. But uh, if he's a two-way guy, he's not going to be able to play that role all season. So that's something to pay attention to. The one guy who has changed teams over the past 24 hours is Luke Marmute. Marmute went from a minimum contract on the Houston Rockets to a one-year, another one-year deal. One-year, $4.3 million contract with the LA Clippers. He is going to slide in and be the backup behind the Rooster Danilo Gallinari and Tobias Harris at the three and the four, most likely ahead of Wes Johnson and uh, and Sam Decker in that rotation. Mamute was a top 200 player last season, barely, in almost 26 minutes per game. Maybe he gets the same sort of playing time, 26, 27 minutes. He's not going to be a threat for the top 100 or probably even the top 150 He averaged 1.2 steals, which is valuable, and that's a streaming type thing there, but usage of 13% on the Rockets team. Doesn't get assists or rebounds. Doesn't really block shots. Bad free throw shooter. There's not a lot to really like with Luke as an overall fantasy contributor. Did hit 36% of his threes, uh, so that's an improvement from what he'd done in the past, although, sorry, the year before for the Clippers, he did hit 39%, but he's never going to be an option for majority of fantasy leagues. It's an interesting move by the Rockets who have lost Trevor Ariza and Luke Marmute. They are apparently really aggressively pursuing Carmelo Anthony once his buyout is done. That might not work out that well. I think that Melo could be in for a better year with the Rockets than what he had last season with the Thunder because Chris Paul and Jim Harden are much different players to what Russell Westbrook and Paul George are, and they can actually be guys who set other players up in better positions. 
But if Melo starts taking the ball out of their hands and his defense uh, is a real problem, and, and it is a real problem, we're well aware of that, that could be a real disaster for the Rockets. They still haven't brought back Clint Capella, who also looks like he's leaning towards taking the qualifying offer. I did have someone ask me today, oh, Josh, why doesn't another team just come in and um, yeah, offer, offer a max to Capella and force the Rockets' hand? Well, the reason is, is no one can. There's no cap space available. The most cap space around is the Hawks can get to $22 million, I believe, if they renounce a couple of cap holds. The Kings have about $20 million, and that's it. But that's not a max for Capella. And maybe they could go out there, the Kings, and throw $20 million off a sheet at Clint and force the Rockets to match. But there's no other team who's got the ability to even get to that level. You can't offer a an offer sheet, a contract, if you don't have the cap space to do it. And there's just no teams who have got that ability currently at this point. So Mahmoud goes to the Clippers. It could mean more minutes for P.J. Tucker. Almost definitely will be. Melo's going to slide in. Maybe Gerald Green gets some extra playing time there in Houston as well. Maybe it opens up things for my boy Isaiah Hartenstein, which we'll talk about him a little bit later in the Summer League portion of the show. Speaking of the Summer League portion of the show, let's talk about it now. Let's talk about my player of the day from day three in uh, at Las Vegas Summer League, and that is the Fort Kevin Knox of the New York Knicks. Knox was great in Game 1, equally impressive in Game 2. Had 19 points with 5 rebounds, 2 assists and 2 steals. Shot poorly, 5 of 15 from the field. Did go 7 of 8 from the free throw line. But he's been super impressive in both of these games, averaging 20 points so far in his first two Summer League outings. He is a guy that I talked about a lot in the pre-draft and post-draft shows on, on here. Talking about how his statistical translations didn't look fantastic. He was below average in pretty much every statistical category. The shooting percentages didn't look great. Now, he is really young, and I did stress this, that guys coming out of Kentucky, you have to give them a massive benefit of the doubt because so many guys that come out of Kentucky show extra assets or extra facets, that's the word I'm looking for, extra facets to their game once they are, once they are in the NBA. Devin Booker, Carl Anthony Towns, Trey Lyles. I could keep going on with these guys. And Kevin Knox and Shea Gilgis-Alexander were two lottery picks from Kentucky who had that ability to show more. And Knox has shown a little bit more so far in Summer League. He has. There's a couple of things that make me think that the Summer League performance here isn't going to be translatable. And that's the fact that he's on 30% usage with a true shooting of 49%. Now, both those numbers will change. The usage will drop significantly. The true shooting will likely come up. But he was never a great true shooting guy in college. Only 55% true shooting, which is not a great number. So that's somewhat of a concern. Also, his assist, his rebound rate, his steal rate, and his block rate are all higher in summer league than what they were in college. Now, we've known that the block rate and rebound rate, and to an extent, assist rate from summer league can be translatable through to the regular season of the NBA. Steal rate and field goal percentage isn't necessarily, but the fact that his steal rate and block rate and assist rate are significantly higher than what they were in college gives you a level of pause considering he played 37 games in college and he's played two in summer league. But then he, where's that? Where's the Kentucky factor come in there? Is it the fact that it's a small game, two, a two game sample size in summer league or is it him showing extra things that he wasn't able to do at Kentucky? I guess that's the rub there. Now, I think that there's a real chance that he is a starter for the Knicks this season. And I think that Kevin Knox should be considered someone that you would look at as a last second round, second last round pick in a fantasy draft. Because I think they're going to start either Nilakina or Trey Burke, Tim Hardaway at shooting guard, and then Knox and Mario Hazonia as the three and the four with Ennis Cantor at center. Because remember, he's out and he's not going to be there to start the season and could miss the majority of the year. So we're going to have that open position at the three and at the four. Courtney Lee won't be starting at the three. David Fisdale has come out and said he is a two. So there's that opportunity there. He's been raving about the fort. And you know, Knox has this opportunity. But can he bring the assists, the steals, the rebounds that he didn't show in college, where he was below average in every area? And can he be efficient? They are all real concerns, but I'd be happy to take him in that last pick. I'm just not sure he has real star upside. The draft projection stuff over at the Stepien run by Jacob Goldstein you know, shows that he's got more of a chance of being a non-NBA level player than he does of being really a consistent starter. And that's a little bit worrisome based on his statistical stuff. But again, the Kentucky factor is a real thing that we need to pay attention to. And he has been strong through these first two games of Summer League. 
And we do have to give him a little bit of a boost for that Kentucky thing and the fact that he's been so good. But massive high usage, low true shooting, and let's see how all this other stuff plays out for the Fort as he moves forward in his NBA career. Let's go through the other action from day three in NBA Summer League. The Minnesota Timberwolves take, took on the Toronto Raptors. Kata Bates-Diop was much better in game two than game one, 24 and 11 with a steal and two blocks. And that's very much in line with the sort of production he was able to put up at Ohio State. He's not going to get playing time. Taj Gibson, Anthony Tolliver, Gorgie Jing, Carl Anthony Towns, Justin Patton's in the mix there. Jimmy Butler at small forward, who can play a little bit at small forward there as well. Bates Diop, probably not too much. Um, but it's a name to, to watch out for in future years as a second round picker, as a, a deeper dynasty guy you can take a look at. Emil Jefferson did what he does, got rebounds, and is a name to watch, not necessarily in Minnesota, but someone who could come in at some point in the season and have an impact. Well, Josh Okoge had 16 points, two steals, and a block. Like Okoge, rotation minutes are going to be hard to come by under Thibodeau because he is a rookie, but someone I do like for the long term. For the Raptors, the Jedi. Hello there. OG Ananobi had 13 and 7, three assists to steal and a block, and that's a block in each of his first two summer league games now. Something that was severely lacking from his stats last year. Blocked a ton of shots in Indiana, didn't block any in the NBA really. Uh, and if he can get that part of his game back going, that pushes him into top 80, top 75 level production. I think that um, Ananobi is a really, really strong uh, dynasty guy. I know he's not going to be a high usage player, but you can be top 80, top 70. Shit, you can be a top 20 guy like Draymond Green without being able to be a high-level scorer. Now, he's not going to get the assist that Draymond does, but his assist ability has improved, and he's starting to show it here. Malachi Richardson also played well, dropping in 15 points off the bench, as did our, my brother, Jordan Lloyd. 17 points in his 24 minutes for the Raptors. Troy Brown was impressive for the Wizards in their win over the San Antonio Spurs. He had two 20-point games throughout his career at Oregon, and he's had two in Summer League already. 21 points with 12 boards and three steals. Still hasn't had a th hit a three, but he's taking a lot of shots. He's making them. He looks comfortable. He's not really playing that point guard role that he played at Oregon too much either, and he's got an opportunity to be in the rotation immediately with Jody Meeks out. Not going to be too much of an impact guy this season. I still think that his ceiling is relatively limited, but he's come out and played well so far, as has Devin Robinson, a two-way guy last year. He had 24 points with three assists and three steals and two blocks. Could he find his way uh, onto the main roster this season? That might be a little bit of a challenge, but it was strong from him, as it was from Tom Bryant, who had 20 and seven. And I think that Thomas Bryant could actually replace a guy like Jason Smith or even Yan Mihinmi in that backup center role, if not this season, maybe next season. So he is definitely a name to pay attention to. On the Spurs, Derek White only played seven minutes, so not much to look at there with him. Jaron Blossom game had 22 and nine with two blocks. Blossom game did well for Austin in the G League last season. And with Kyle Anderson going, potentially Ka Kawhi Leonard going, Blossom game could find himself on the roster this season, but I wouldn't be uh, expecting too much out of him. But a nice performance from him, as with Chemezi Metu and Lonnie Walker, the two draftees from this season. Walker had 15-5 and five with three steals, and another name who could easily be a part of the rotation with Tony Parker and Kyle Anderson already gone, and potentially Kawhi Leonard on his way out as well. So that's the Spurs side of things there in, uh, in Summer League. The next game, we'll look at the Charlotte Hornets and the Miami Heat. Bill Hernan Gomez had a big 22-10 and 10 game. But yeah, that center position in Charlotte's a little bit weird. Cody Zeller is there, Hernan Gomez, and now Bismack Biombo. And while none of them are great, none of them are also terrible. I imagine Zeller starts with Hernan Gomez off the bench and Bismack as a third stringer, but the case could easily be made for Biombo becoming the backup center and playing minutes over Hernan Gomez, especially with the defensive concerns that Bill has. Now, if Billy can get 22 minutes, 23 minutes a night, that's a standard league type player, but his upside is limited by the presence of these other two. Now, Zeller has had trouble staying healthy over the last couple of seasons, and if Bill comes in and plays 27 a night, then you smash the shit out of him as a top 50 type of guy, top 60 type of guy. But if everyone is healthy, he's not going to get to that level. I still think that he is a standard league type guy. Malik Monk was out with a fractured thumb, so the Baconator, Dwayne Bacon, took on his initiating role, 22-6 and six with three steals, with Travion Graham potentially leaving or an unrestricted free agent. Bacon and Miles Bridges will be competing for that role. Bridges looked better in this game than he did in the first performance where he was a, he struggled a little bit. 
On the Heat side of things, my man Landry Noko had 12 and 13 with a block. A good G League player to keep an eye on in the second half of the season for deeper leagues. While Derek Jones Jr. suffered an ankle sprain, had 9 points, and he won't be playing in the rest of Las Vegas Summer League, unfortunately, for uh, for him, because he was playing pretty well. Um, which game are we going to look at now? We're going to look at... Um, hmm, let's have a look. Oh, there we go. The Portland Trailblazers and the uh, Atlanta Hawks. Anthony Simons off the bench had 12 points in 20 minutes with three steals. He looks at home. The defense has been fine. He hasn't quite got everything happening, but shooting the ball well, got to the line... Uh, okay, hit both of his free throws here. Mc- McCollum, Lillard, Seth Curry, Wade Baldwin. There's a few guards in front of him in Portland. He is still really young, and I do like Simons' ability in a couple of years' time to maybe have a couple of top 100 type seasons. Zachy Collins suffered an ankle injury in this one, eight and seven, and had five blocks. You know I do like Collins' defensive upside and fantasy upside for those blocks, for his ability to hit threes, uh, can be a solid rebounder as well. Um, going to have an, an okay role this year with Ed Davis gone. So he's a, a deeper league guy to pay attention to. Well, excuse me. <coughs> Had to sneeze. Wade Baldwin, seven points, eight rebounds, and 10 assists. Has looked really good in, in both summer league games. And should be able to find his way onto the main roster with Shabazz Napier gone now as well. Jake Lehman played well, 23 points, while Caleb Swanigan sucked and had only the five. For the Hawks, the Baptist John Collins, 18 and nine, a steal and a block. He is a top 50 player for this upcoming season. I'm pretty confident about that. He's going to play a ton of minutes. He's going to get shots. He's, he's improved his defense. He's going to be really good. And I think he's a top 50 guy for this year. Trey Young suffered a quad bruise. Zero points, three assists. Uh, has not been great in summer league. We know that. There is still some bust potential with Trey, but he is a guy that I'd be taking a flyer on in the last couple of rounds of drafts for this year. And I still have decent hope for him, but there is a, a level of risk there. Uh, Jalen Adams, I thought, played well again. Seven points, didn't shoot well, but had three rebounds, four assists, and a steal. He's a two-way guy for them this season, Jalen Adams, not to be confused with Jalen Morris, who was a two-way guy last year. Jalen Adams is a guy that I do think has an okay level of uh, dynasty upside, while the wizard, Amari Spellman, had three steals and two blocks, and has been okay. It wasn't his greatest game, and he's not really going to be able to find a regular spot in the rotation. Let's go on to the Dallas Mavericks. Dennis Smith Jr. only played 20 minutes, did uh, Smitty. Had 10 points, 7 assists, and 4 steals, and missed all 7 of his 3-point attempts. He should be a lock for the top 100 this season, probably pushing to top 60, top 70. Really interested into seeing what he can do. The golf ball, Ray Spalding, had uh, 8 points in a start. Not much there. Well, John Motley, 20 points, 7 rebounds. There's still limited opportunities for Motley. Dirk, DeAndre, Dwight Powell, Maxi Kleber, all these guys are ahead of him in the rotation at this point, but he can produce. And we saw that last season when he got an extended opportunity. The burner, Jalen Brunson, is really, really struggling. Six points, um, one of nine from the field. Did have three steals, but he is struggling. He probably won't be in the rotation to begin the season, especially with Yogi Ferrell back. On to the Bucks side of things. Christian Wood, 10-10 and 10 with two steals and three blocks. Continues to rack up those defensive stats, but with Brook Lopez signing that the Bucks are going to have to wave Tyler Zeller, it looks like. I don't see Wood making the Bucks roster, but he could find himself on another team, and being one of these interesting uh, blocks, defensive stat type streamer guys, who, and he could find himself on a team where he gets a role at least at some point this season. So he is a name to pay attention to. DJ Wilson struggled. I don't think he's an NBA caliber player, while Sterling Brown had 14 points in his 26 minutes. The Warriors took on the Rockets. Very little to to really get excited about from a Warriors point of view here in this one. Jacob Evans didn't do too much. Marcus Derrickson dropped in 23 points with seven rebounds, a steal and a block. A very, very full line from Derrickson, but he's unlikely to be a contributor for any team this season. Well, Jordan Bell stuffed the stat sheet again. Only two points in 16 minutes, but five boards, two assists, three steals, and two blocks. He is going to be a draftable player, at least for, or he's going to be a rosterable player, draftable player for the first few months until DeMarcus Cousins returns. He he may start, it might be Kevon Looney, but he's going to be getting a ton of minutes. JaVale has gone. Zaza has gone. David West might be out. I think we're going to see 20, 24 plus minutes from Jordan Bell until at least DeMarcus Cousins returns to action. On the Rockets side of things, DeAnthony Melton, 17 with five rebounds, four steals and a block. So I talk about Michael Carter-Williams earlier on and his ability to provide defense for this Rockets team. I think Melton 
has an opportunity to overtake him at some point this season. Uh, love what he was able to do here. Started off slowly, but the shot started to come around. I think he's going to be a real... You know, three years in, I think he's going to be a potential top 150 fantasy guy. Trayvon Duval struggled after a, a really good first game. Vince Edwards has struggled the whole time, while my man Isaiah Hartenstein had 12-7 and seven with a block. Really good fantasy translations from Hartenstein, so he is someone to pay attention to. RJ Hunter also scored the ball really, really well. Let's go on to another set of games now. The Memphis Grizzlies and the Orlando Magic. Just ugliness from Memphis, lost by 30 points. Um, Triple J, only five points, but 10 rebounds and a block. I think he's a top 100 guy this season. He's a top 25 upside dynasty player. Really, really like uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. Kobe Simmons had 15 points with a steal. I don't like Kobe Simmons really as a player. I don't think he is an NBA caliber guy. Javon Carter continues to struggle as well for this team. Wasn't a great outing from this entirety of this Memphis team. On the Magic side of things, my man John Isaac, impressive again. 12 and 7, two assists, two steals, five blocks. Where does he fit in though? Will they play him at the three? I have my doubts. John Simmons and Terry Ross are both there. Aaron Gordon signed to an extraordinarily large contract. Uh, Mo Bumba. One, two, three, four, five. He's there as a center. Nick Vucevic is there. So is Isaac going to be able to find himself 20 minutes per game? That's that m might be the limit, which is unfortunate. I think he's I think he's going to be better than Aaron Gordon. I think he's got the upside to be the best player on this Magic team, better than Bumba, better than Gordon. Um, but whether he gets there this season, I'm not quite sure. He's still an excellent dynasty asset, and you should be trying to require him, especially if early in the season his minutes are limited. But it's it's one to watch. Um, Troy Copan had 10 points with 7 rebounds, 5 assists and a steal. I really like Copan's um, sneaky deep dynasty value. While uh, Mo Bamba had 11 and 5 with a block. Hasn't really stood out too much. Only played 15 minutes in this one. Melvin Frazier brought the defense with 2 blocks as well. He's an interesting type player uh, as we move forward. Let's have a look at the last bunch of games. Actually, no, we're not. I've still got one more to go from that screen. I'm just jumping ahead of myself. Um, the uh, Utah Jazz and the uh, New York Knicks. George Nian continues to rack up the numbers. 20 and 8, two steals, a block. He's not going to get rotation minutes, but he was a guy that translated well coming out of Iowa State, played for Indiana, played for Golden State. Now, with the Jazz, um, if an opportunity ever arises, then he's someone to watch. But there's just so much depth in Utah that it's unlikely. Tone Bradley had 16 points, one rebound, which is pretty low. But he's looked much better than last season for this team as well. Not much else to really talk about with the Jazz. On the Knicks, we talked about Kevin Knox already, the fort. Frankie Nilakina also did well, 17 points with six assists. And Mitchell Robinson, 12 and 11 with two blocks. I think Mitchell Robinson's a starting center in two years' time three years' time, and will be a top 70 fantasy player. I, I think there's that upside there. Alonzo Trier also looking good as a two-way guy. 15 points, took 16 shots, but has looked pretty solid in both games so far. So a nice two-way signing there from the New York Knicks. Let's go on to the last couple of games. Justin Jackson is looking really good. And again, I'm not high on this guy. I don't think he's an NBA quality starter, but 28 points with four rebounds and two assists. And generally, when he has these big scoring nights, it's on stupidly high percentages. 10 of 19, still pretty high, but it's not 60, 70%. Still doesn't do anything in the other areas, really. Four rebounds and two assists, but that's a strong performance. Same with Frank Mason, who had 12 and six assists. And um, Harry Giles, eight and five in his 14 minutes, which is really good production in limited playing time. There was no Marvin Bagley the third who's dealing with a hip injury at the moment, but Giles has been really impressive, I think, uh, so far in, the, in Summer League. For the Clippers, big game from Cinderius Thornwell, 22-6-4. There's just too many guards, though, in LA. Lou Williams, Shea Gilgis-Alexander, Jerome Robinson, Patrick Beverly, Avery Bradley. Now you bring in Marmute at the three with, with Cinderius played a little bit. Ty Wallace, CJ Williams, are these guys back? I like Thornwell. I think that he is a, an interesting top 100 upside for maybe a couple of years in his career. I just don't think it happens this season. Shea also was great, 21 and eight, two assists and three steals. He's gonna to struggle to get enough minutes to be impactful this season. But Patrick Beverly could very easily be gone after this year. Avery Bradley should be gone after this year. And you could see Shea starting as early as next season, uh, I believe. Jerome Robinson didn't, uh, didn't play in this game and he hasn't been overly impressive so far. 
The last game of the day was the Lakers taking on the Chicago Bulls. Josh the Hitman Hart had 19.6 rebounds and three assists. Is there a chance that he starts over Contavious Caldwell Pope this season? Yeah, there's a chance. Is it likely? Probably not. But Hart should be a pretty key piece of this rotation, the four-guard rotation of Lonzo Ball, Rajon Rondo, Contavious Caldwell Pope, and the Hitman. It's not going to be enough for him to be an impactful standard league guy, but he has been good as has Sfi Mikhailuk, who had 15, two and three with two steals. Now people are throwing, oh man, he's Clay Thompson. Just calm your tits. Like he's played well, he's shot well, and the Lakers need shooters, we know that. But where is he fitting in the rotation? Is it ahead of Lonzo, Rondo, KCP, Hart, LeBron, Ingram? Where, where's, where's he fitting in here? Um, who else have we, we got on this team? Um, there's other people that it's completely slipping in my mind. Obviously, their center rotation is a mess at this point. Um, and Svee might be an occasional rotation guy and probably should play ahead of Lance Stevenson, but he's not going to be a, an excellent type of, um, of fantasy contributor. But the shooting has been impressive from him, no doubt about that. I want to talk a little bit about Flaming Mo Wagner. Who was uh, impressive again. Eight points but 14 boards, now shot terribly, four of 15, but 14 boards, three steals, and two blocks, putting up you know, really, really strong numbers. And with JaVale McGee as your penciled in starting center, with Ivica Zubats there, there's a real chance that Wagner gets significant playing time this season. Now his defense is going to be a, a problem, and that might limit what he can do. But much like when we were talking about um, Kevin Knox earlier on and his numbers, Wagner is, is doing very similar things. His block rate through all five summer league games he's played is 7.4%. That, uh, that is a lot. His three years in Michigan, his block rate was 1.9%. I do not believe that he has become a three and a half times better shot blocker. His steal rate at Michigan was 2.3. His steal rate in summer league is 3.9. You know, well above where he was at. Um, the other numbers, they're not as uh, egregiously different. The rebounding at 13.5 in Michigan, and he's running at 19.5. So it's still, actually, that's still a pretty significantly large difference. He's not shooting the ball well in summer league, 47% true shooting, and that's really what he hung his hat on at Michigan. So there are things there where the production from him has, has been good. Yeah, through the five games, he's averaging 13.6 points, nine rebounds, two steals, and two blocks. I have significant doubts that those steals and blocks are going to continue. The rebounding might dip. I also don't think he's going to continue to shoot 29% from three or 36 from the field. But as a shooting rookie, um, his efficiency is not going to be great. So while there is a chance with McGee and Zubats as the other two options that Wagner could actually start for this team, he's not going to be a 30 minute per night guy. And I don't think that these steal and block numbers that he's put up in these five summer league games so far are going to be something that carries over to the regular season. I could be wrong, but it would be an astonishing change to see him all of a sudden become this elite rim protector and defensive type player when he struggled so much with that. So while well, it's been great and he's been impressive and you go, shit, this is good, man. Well done from Mo. Um, I'm just not sure that all this stuff is going to be able to continue. The Chicago Bulls, we had uh, Wendell Carter Jr. Only played 26 minutes, but a little bit of an injury. Still looks strong out there. Four blocks, 9.7 rebounds. If he gets 30 minutes, again, it's Chris Felicio, Punch Bob Shiploke, and Robin Lopez in front of him. So th you could very easily see him coming in and by November being a starting center. Yeah, he's a top 100 guy. A, a really interesting late round pick in, in drafts. Chandler Hutchinson didn't do too much here, just the seven points. Looked okay, but didn't look fantastic. Antonio Blakeney, man, he has never made a shot he didn't want to take. Five points on 15 shots. Just an absolute chucker in the Justin Holiday mold. Uh, I don't think he's going to be getting too much of a rotation spot, maybe unless David Nawaba doesn't come back for this Bulls team. But really impressed with uh, Wendell Carter Jr. Had him at seventh in my dynasty rookie ranks. I'd be inclined to even maybe put him a little bit higher. I could see him going ahead of Bumba or even ahead of Marvin Bagley. I think his star upside is really there and an ability to contribute right across the board. He has looked very, very good in the two games that he has played so far. That will wrap it up for today's show, guys. Again, check the Red Rock Challenge info on my Twitter timeline. Follow me on Twitter and on Instagram at redrock underscore b-ball and subscribe to this podcast. Apple Podcasts, Google Play, TuneIn, Stitcher, and on Spotify, and on YouTube. Smash that red box underneath there. Give me a thumbs up. 
leave a comment also and go leave a five-star rating on the podcast as well and check out the rest of the Locked On Podcast Network over on Twitter at Locked On NBA Net on Facebook the same as well. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. Robin Lopez.